I had started this video as a sort of excuse to complete all the Dark Souls and Bloodborne content I hadn't completed yet. Despite my love for From Software and the Souls-like genre that they had created, I had not completed many of the toughest bosses in this series, nor had I played most of the DLCs. Hell, up until now I hadn't even beaten base Dark Souls 2, let alone its DLCs. So, with Shadow of the Earth Tree allegedly on the horizon, I decided that it would be yet again cool and fun to play through all the From Software DLCs and rank them from worst to best, in my opinion of course. These expansions are, in order of release, Artorias of the Abyss for Dark Souls 1, The Sunken, Old Iron, and Ivory King Crowns from Dark Souls 2, The Old Hunters from Bloodborne, and finally, Ashes of Ariandel and the Ring City from Dark Souls 3. Not only will we be ranking these DLCs, but we will also be ranking the 24 bosses across all 7 DLCs. And with these expansions containing some of the most legendary and difficult bosses in From Software's history, it'll be interesting to see who will get crowned the DLC boss god of the pack. So with all that intro spilled, let's get right into our first DLC, Artorius of the Abyss. DLC number one, Artorius of the Abyss. Artorius of the Abyss starts when you head down to Darkroot Basin and slay the massive Hydra in the water, which is a pretty cool fight, as you cut off each Hydra head one by one until it's fully headless. Although these heads love to arc far away from you and try to bait you into falling off the underwater cliff that the Hydra is standing behind, which led to a few crusty deaths. But thanks to some guidance from a message showing me where the last head reaches to, the Hydra is slain. Once that's done, a golden crystallion will spawn in the cave that's in the top left corner of the lake. But he won't spawn in just yet. You have to reload the area first to get him to appear. So after teleporting away and returning to the lake cave, the golden crystallion will be there waiting for an ass whooping. After said whooping, a lady then pops out of the crystallion's body and identifies herself as Dusk, a princess from a place called Ulusil. Dusk tells us that she's from the past and that Ulusil had been destroyed long ago. And she asks us if she wants her to hook us up with some ancient sorceries which we agree to, and she thanks us, and disappears from this plane of existence. We still can't enter Ulusil yet though. To get there, we need to grab a broken pendant from a kind of random crystallion in the Duke's archives, and with a pendant in hand, we make our third trip down to Darkroot Basin, and now, there's a portal in the cave, and when we approach, we're snatched up by a freaking looking massive hand and get pulled straight into the past. We then wake up in the Sanctuary Garden, and this expansion wastes no time in throwing you into a boss battle, having you fight the Sanctuary Guardian to kick off the DLC in earnest. This boss has a cool look to him. I like the chimera style beast design with his lion head, scorpion tail, and two sets of wings. But this boss is pretty underwhelming. Feeling more like a tough enemy you'd run to during a level run through, rather than a proper boss fight if you know what I mean. He does the typical charges, swipes, and bites that beast enemies will do, and also shoots lightning at you for some ranged options. But all these attacks are pretty simple and easy to dodge, with its only standout attack being a move where the guardian rises into the air awkwardly. I mean, he looks like he's really struggling to get up there before shooting a large lightning blast before falling back down to earth. His health pool is also pretty small, and my Zweihander was taking off massive chunks of health with each swing, and thanks to that, I was able to down the Sanctuary Guardian on my first try with pretty little trouble. Once he's cooked, we can proceed into the Ulusil Sanctuary and talk to a friendly massive mushroom NPC, Elizabeth. Elizabeth asks us to find and save Princess Dusk, who has been captured by the final boss of this DLC, Manus. Alright, story time. Earlier, I mentioned that Ulusil had been long since destroyed. This occurred because the residents of Ulusil, possibly under the direction of Darkstalker Koth, had dug up Manus' grave, Manus himself being a quote, primeval human. This rude awakening from his eternal dirt nap had Manus proper fuming, causing his humanity to quote, run wild, and he started spreading the abyss, a realm of darkness created via the power of the dark soul that corrupts all it touches, and it spread all throughout Ulusil turning its residents into deformed, tumbleweed-headed monsters and causing the town itself to crumble and sink into the abyssal chasm below the town, with Manus himself morphing from a human into a massive bestial darkness monster. I'm still not sure how he pulled that one off. This abyssal outbreak gained the attention of the legendary knight Artorius the Abyss Walker, who then traveled to Ulusil with his dog to kill Manus and stop the spread of the abyss, but the abyssal father was too much for Artorius, eventually being defeated by Manus and falling to the abyss becoming a corrupted shell of his former self. We then agree to slay Artorius and Manus, and to rescue Dusk from the worst dad ever. We then strike out into the DLC's first main area, the Royal Wood. It's a pretty cool area, feeling like a lighter, darker garden with plenty of space to explore and a pretty decent chunk of enemies to fight. I really like the design of the weaker gardener enemies. You can see them trimming the trees and their models have gardening tools such as watering cans and shovels hanging off of them, and they attack using rakes and hedge trimmers. They fit the level aesthetic great. My only issue with this area is that due to the large amount of enemies, it's pretty easy to get ganked and surrounded while traversing, which makes trying to kill all the enemies a very methodical and drawn out process, 
which can be a little tedious. But after my first pass through the level, I just ended up running past all the enemies anyway. Once we're through the Royal Wood, we can meet up with Marvelous Chester, who I'm told is a sort of teaser for Miyazaki's at the time unannounced next project, which ended up being, you all, you know. Which makes a lot of sense, as Chester is the most visually unique NPC in all of Dark Souls 1 in my opinion, sporting some very Yarnum-esque clothes, a top hat, and a weird white Joker mask. I'm glad Bloodborne didn't lean into this clown theming. He even dodges like a Bloodborne character when he invades you, and it's super cool to go back and see this teaser with the knowledge we have now. But once we're done chatting with Chester, it's time to go take on the man on the cover himself, Artorius the Abyss Walker. Artorius is the boss that I believe marked From Software's first major evolution in boss design that would go on to be expanded on and perfected by Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3. This fight just has a different tempo than the other base game bosses. His swings are hard and fast, with a robust array of slashes, gap closing stabs, and overhead slams, all of which he can combo together for some serious punishment. Bro can spam that jump slam up to three times in a row. And all that shit gets even nastier if he powers up, where he'll both hit harder and take less damage. But luckily, his power obsession can be interrupted to keep him at his normal state. He also has a god tier presentation, and it's obvious from the design of him that he's got a serious case of manasitis. A miasma of abyss emanates from every step he takes, and his sword slams leave puddles of abyssal goop on the ground of the arena. I also like how he's only using one hand, with his right arm lifelessly dangling and flopping around with his movements, showing us that he must have been severely injured in his fight with Manus, and it's just another masterclass in nonverbal storytelling from From Software. My only complaint about this fight is that I found it almost too easy. Being able to interrupt his abyssal roid gas session was huge for keeping the fight manageable, and my Zweihander was also taking hefty chunks of health with each swing, and I was able to beat him on my fourth try. If he is interrupted, Artorius lacks an actual second phase, and if you're familiar with the faster paced combat of the later From games, Artorius isn't anything you haven't seen before, so taking him down is very manageable once you're more familiar with his attacks. And although it didn't make a huge impact on me, I can see why this fight is so beloved. His design and presentation are fantastic, and his actual fight is a noticeable step up from the other bosses in the game in terms of attack types and combos, and I sort of see him as a blueprint for later FromSoft bosses and enemies, and for that, I gotta give Artorias my respect. Once Artorias is slain, we can proceed into the town of Ulusil itself, which is in some pretty rough shape. The residents have all been morphed into long-armed, tumbleweed-headed freaks who can assault you or cast spells at you, which can be annoying at times as a melee-only player in some of Ulusil's more cramped areas. But I digress. Ulusil has some pretty nice verticality to it, and our goal here is to descend into the town and eventually into the Chasm of the Abyss, and there are a lot of precarious paths and bridges to easily fall off of. So watch your step. And watch for ganks. Ulusil feels both spacious and cramped, depending on where you are in the level, and traversing it was a decent challenge in crowd control and carefulness. But once we get through the town, we fight this... Uh, this, this fucking thing. And we finally reach our literal heart of darkness, the Abyssal Chasm. The Chasm is the last area of this DLC, and probably simultaneously my favorite and least favorite area of this DLC. On one hand, the Chasm is super cool in a mysterious place, managing to feel dark and ominous without having to resort to the jet black void that the Tomb of Giants uses to artificially inflate the difficulty. I also really like the humanity sprite enemies, they just look so weird and out of place, and really stand out to me amongst all the other enemies in this game even if they're kind of annoying to fight. There's also some really cool areas to this place. Behind an illusory wall, we can find Puppy Sif, and if you rescue him, you can use him as a summon to fight Manus. But Sif was riding the bench for the Manus fight, as I won't be using summons for these boss battles. But it's still cool to have regardless. But on the other hand, there wasn't another bonfire in the chasm, so every time I went to go fight Manus, I had to do a fairly long boss run through the entire chasm to reach him again. And this is one spot in the run where an out-of-reach caster can light you up as you try to cross the fallen pillar bridge to the Manus boss room, and it's pretty tough to get past him without taking a hit. This little bastard can seemingly get at least one magic missile on you. Fuck this little guy. If there was a safer or shorter route to Manus, I definitely missed it. And you'll be making this run a lot, because you'll be fighting the undisputed toughest boss in the entire game, Manus, Father of the Abyss. Manus is a very interesting boss, as he feels out of place in Dark Souls 1. Manus is fast, like Dark Souls 3 fast. Although he'd probably be a lower to mid-level boss in Dark Souls 3 or Bloodborne, his speed pushes the combat of Dark Souls 1 to its absolute limit. The dodges don't get tighter than this, and I was excited just to pull off a dodge of one of Manus's moves, and Manus has combos for days. He has this one combo that starts with a quick and hard to dodge swipe from his monster hand, and if you're caught in this or any subsequent attack in his combo, you'll lose at least half your health bars. Manus will literally juggle you, and then slam you to the ground. It's absolutely brutal. Don't even try to dodge after getting hit. It's futile. 
Not only that, but Manus also blends into the darkness of the abyss in the arena, making his attacks that much harder to see and anticipate. But those glowing red eyes in the dark looks fire. And his design has some motifs like the oversized hairy extendable hand that you can see be reimagined by later bosses, like the demon of hatred of Sekiro and so on. His array of attacks is immense, having several slams, swipes, and at least three different massive magic attacks, and jump slams, and all of these moves can combo into each other. Manus' aggression is downright oppressive as well. Bro is definitely reading these inputs, as going for a heal at any other time besides right after the end of an attack is pretty much a one-way ticket back to the bonfire, and there were many times I had to pass up an opportunity to attack to heal instead, as I was literally unconfident in my ability to stay alive until the next opportunity, which although is ass clenchingly hard, is a positive for this fight. He also turns the tables on the player by having a jump back dodge move, which was causing me to whiff a lot of attacks. Everyone gangsta until the boss starts dodging. Manus forces you to master every tight dodge window and be intimately familiar with his combos and their lengths. It is the penultimate challenge of Dark Souls 1, and it did not disappoint. And after 23 brutal L's and treks through the chasm, I finally killed Manus, which I was mildly pleased about. Let's go! Let's fucking go! I think about half the time I spent in this DLC was just traveling to and fighting Manus. And despite his brutal combos and tight as fuck dodge windows, I really enjoyed this fight, and taking him down for the first time felt better than nutting. If Artorius was the first step towards From Software's future enemy design and pace, Manus truly cemented that design upgrade. You wouldn't feel out of place at all in Elden Ring, and beating a boss with speed like that in the much clunkier Dark Souls 1 was extremely satisfying. He is just this game's ultimate challenge. Once Manus dies, Dusk reappears, although despondent and flopped over on the floor. I'm probably missing an item here to get her to wake up, but I'm not too sure. So I return to Elizabeth, who thanks me for saving Dusk, telling me that even though nobody will remember what we did here, she still will. Well, I hope she told someone our story before she got petrified in Dark Souls 3, otherwise we're never going to get the clout we deserve. But we're not done yet. There's still one more enemy to fight. This DLC's optional boss, Black Dragon Calamite. To fight Calamite, we first have to go to his arena at the end of the river and get melted by his piss flames, as since he's flying around, we can't whack him with our Zweihander, therefore he is currently unkillable. To bring him down to earth, we have to go talk to Hawkeye Go, another one of Gwyn's knights and an expert marksman. I love this guy. He's got such a silly voice and is probably the most friendly and helpful NPC in the entire game. As he will become friendly with us after we kill Artorius and if we ask him nicely, he'll snipe Calamite out of the sky with a trick shot that would humble FaZe Clan. I really like this setup for the fight. It makes the fight feel a little bit more grandiose. After Calamite has been sniped, we can fight him for real. His fight being a solidly challenging dragon battle where he will bite, tail swipe, stomp, fly at the player, and spew golden flames while flying and on the ground. He's got a lot of ways to spew. He's a very solid boss battle. I like his design. His big red evil eye and his thinner, more bird-like head give him a unique look. FromSoft has a good variety in their dragon designs throughout the series. But unfortunately, this battle is a bit spoiled by the fact that the later series dragon fights are just simply better, making him feel a bit lacking by comparison. And some of his animations look pretty stiff, and his massive character model will sometimes just walk into the side of the arena awkwardly. It just looks a little bit rough. But besides these, he's still a really solid and fun fight. It'll probably take a few deaths off of you before you can take him down for good. And with Calamite down, we're done with Artorias of the Abyss. This DLC is an excellent package, featuring the two hardest and best bosses in the game, and the location of Ulusil being a pretty interesting and varied place, going from a scenic garden, to the royal woods, to the crumbling town of Ulusil, to the deep dark pit of the Abyss. It's great stuff. It feels like the perfect endgame challenge for Dark Souls 1, and its reverence among fans isn't surprising to me whatsoever. It set a very high standard for From Software DLCs, which the next game, Dark Souls 2, would try to recapture, sporting not one, but three DLCs that all add new bosses, items, and locations to explore. But do they stack up, or will these expansions make my soul dark? Let's take a look. <laughs> DLC number 2, Crown of the Sunken King. Some background info. I played through all these DLCs on the Scholar of the First Sin version of Dark Souls 2. If you don't know, Scholar of the First Sin was a re-release of Dark Souls 2 that added some new content, changed up enemy and item placements, and bundled the three DLCs as part of its base package. Scholar also changed up how these DLCs start, as in base DS2, the keys needed to access each DLC area were just automatically added to your inventory. But like the rest of Scholar, they added a bit of extra rigmarole to get the keys. For the Sunken King, we need to snag the Dragon Talon, which first requires us to go snag the Forgotten Key, which you get from killing two giants in a hidden area of the Black Gulch, starting this DLC off with a gank. Sweet. Once we have the key, we can use it to open a door in the Majula Well and on a body in the room we can find the Dragon Talon. 
We then return to the poison death trap that is the Black Gulch and past the Primordial Bonfire, we can go up to the Snake Basin Altar thing and teleport to the DLC. Using the Talon to open the door, we walk through some ruined hallways until we end up at a vista overlooking Shulva, the sunken city of this DLC. And it makes an awesome first impression. Seeing the city and Dragon Sanctum from high up looks incredible, and I really like the underground city theming for this expansion. The game is begging you to reach these places and explore, so we get right on it. And as we head into Shulva, we will spot a dragon who wakes up and flies away at our presence. This is the expansion's final boss, Sin the Slubbering Dragon, and now's a good time to explain the story of this expansion. The crown of the Sunken King tells the tale of the Sunken King, no shit, who was the monarch of the city of Shulva, a city that was built around a sanctum that housed our guy Sin, who the Sunken King and his people worshipped as a deity. Which makes sense, dragons are extremely rare in the Dark Souls world after most of them were wiped out by Gwyn and his lordly shooters during their war for dominion with the everlasting dragons. So finding one was an exceptional event. At some point, a fragment of Manus and sister to the final boss of Dark Souls 2, Alana, had met and married the sunken king, and they lived together in Shulva, worshipping they dragon and having a grand old time. This was until Shulva was besieged and invaded by the Drake Blood Knights led by Sir Yorg, who were hunting Sin in order to steal his dragon blood, which they believed granted true understanding of life, or something. That dragon blood probably just got them faded. <laughs> Yorg killed the Sunken King himself and skewered Sin with his spear, which we can still see on Sin's body, which is a really cool visual touch. However, all the spearing managed to do was to wake Sin up and piss him off, and Sin, who has toxic and rotting breath powers, started spewing a toxic fog that rendered all of Shulva uninhabitable, and kill the org in the process. Alana survived this event, however, and still remains in Shulva, guarding Sin and gathering souls until she's strong enough to enact her revenge on the world, which leads us up to our player arriving in Shulva. Shulva is a really cool area with a really clever mechanic. If you hit these glowing posts, you can raise and lower platforms all throughout the city, and they're used in pretty cool ways, being able to be raised to block off archers and break up aggro, as well as a few puzzles to reach some items and raised platforms. And in order to get to one of the bonfires, you'll have to raise a series of platforms to create a path you have to jump across to reach said bonfire. And I haven't done this much souls platforming since the Better Chaos battle. And just like there, these crusty souls jumps can lead to some goofy ass deaths. <laughs> Shulva is also jam packed with these skeletal soldier enemies that can use both melee and ranged attacks. And fights with them can get pretty hairy with lots of cliffs and holes to fall down into after a wild dodge. So be careful. But besides the large number of enemies, this DLC manages to avoid those scholar patented gang squads for the most part. Enemies will still hunt you down for miles though, so just keep an eye out. Once done with Shulva, we cross the bridge to that massive sanctum we saw from a distance earlier, and we enter the Dragon Sanctum. The Dragon Sanctum is probably my favorite place in this DLC, as it's great at building tension, especially when you first arrive, as there are no bonfires inside of the sanctum, and I was tense as hell running away from the ghost knights and trying to find a shortcut or a safe spot or anything as I went deeper and deeper into the sanctum. It's pretty great, and as you learn more about the sanctum, break the ghost knights' bodies to expose them, and open up shortcuts into and out of the sanctum, you'll start feeling like you're slowly conquering and breaking down the place which I thought was super satisfying to do. My only issue with the Sanctum being that the inside is a bit drab and samey looking throughout, being mostly featureless stone gray rooms and corridors. And I was not a fan of fighting these poison versions of the skeletal soldiers from Shulva. They build up poison quickly and they're just twice as annoying to fight. Not a fan. I snag a key that unlocks a door near the Sanctum entrance and that opens a path to a nearby bonfire but I can't use that bonfire until I fight off this dumbass invader. And I gotta say, DS2 has by far the most NPC invasions in the entire Souls series. In other games, a hostile NPC invasion was a pretty rare event. But in Dark Souls 2, I feel like almost every level has at least one hostile invader. Some levels even have several. In the Black Gulch, I fought two invaders in a row that spawned in the same spot and had almost the same name. These DLCs are full of hostile invaders just like the base game too. And encounters with hostile invaders are more annoying than interesting, unfortunately. But using some cheeky backstabs, which are also changed in this game, as before you can get a backstab off, your character will do a punch move where they clock the enemy across the face, then backstab them. But I've had a few times where the punch occurred, but the enemy was able to either break out or no backstab occurred, which felt very crusty at times. I'm not sure if the punch is supposed to be broken out of, but gameplay-wise, it feels disjointed and almost like a bug. But regardless... From this bonfire, we can access an optional area, the Cave of the Dead, which is probably a bottom 5 area in From Software history. Although the cave is pretty small, it is packed to the absolute tits with enemies and projectiles shooting statues that petrify and insta-kill you if built up. These statues can go get bent. 
They're frustratingly accurate and can stagger you for a few seconds if you're hit by them twice in a row. So your character is fucking around doing the woe, completely exposed if you walk the wrong way in front of these statues. There's no tell that they're about to fire and they can seemingly shoot at multiple angles. So my best strategy was to just spam roll past them. It's called the Cave of the Dead because this place is going to kill you at least once as you frantically sprint through it trying to find the path forward. But luckily, once you know the path forward, it's pretty simple to get through. But still, it's just DS2 level design at its absolute worst. Your reward for getting through this death gauntlet is a one-on-three battle in one of the bottom three worst fights in the entire Soul series, not just Dark Souls 2. We have to square up against three NPCs, a dual katana wielding knight, some dude wearing Havel's clothes, and an archer, who are literally known in the Souls community as Gank Squad. I struggled to even consider this a boss. The devs really just threw three NPCs in a room and gave them boss health bars. This fight is simply not fun. It's a tedious grind of running around the boss arena, hopping down into and climbing out of the lower water level in an attempt to break up Gank Squad's positionings to get a few hits in, then repeat. It's just a tedious endurance, and mistakes are heavily punished, as you can easily get comboed by multiple Gank Squad members at once, or just get backstabbed. It's fucking rough. I was able to take them down by taking out the afflicted Grave Robber first, then Sarah, then finally not Havel, as he's the most dangerous one of them all, and he can easily combo you to death if you aren't careful. After beating them, you get a decent sack of rare crafting materials, but I was just happiest that I didn't have to fight them anymore and run through that dog-ass cave anymore. Whew. With Gang Squad gone, we can move on to face Alana. After getting through the Sanctum, we reach the bottom of the Sanctum in the Dragon's Rest area, which isn't much to write home about, mostly being an open area with these oversized goopy Morrowind A-Lit guys. We insert the Dragon Stone and there's a cool view of a stone bridge rising to connect the Sanctum to Shulva and opens the path to Alana, which is a cool area where we have to descend down through the Broken Sanctum and fight the Drake Blood Knights, who have some sweet black armor sets and red capes. Very cool to do the first run through. But a bit of a slog each time after though. Although I think I missed a shortcut to Alana in this section, but it wasn't too big of a deal. Alana is very similar to Nishandra, almost too similar, in both design and moveset. Like her sister, she's also a grim reaperish looking lady with a red color scheme, who also wields a long weapon that she only just swipes with. I will say her entrance is very cool, her back turned to you like a true Vlone soldier, with this Alduin's wall looking stone mural as a backdrop with some pretty great looking lighting effects. The fight itself, however, is pretty underwhelming. Like I said, she's pretty much Nishandra too, casting spells and slowly swinging her weapon if you're close. But she has one unique twist. Alana is a little weak on her own, so she will summon backup, which can be either one of two things. Either three weak and fairly passive skeleton enemies, or she will summon Velstat, one of the hardest base game bosses. That's like summoning either a coughing baby or a hydrogen bomb to help fight with you. If she summons Velstat, it's gonna get hairy, and good luck. But if she summons the skeletons, you'll just have to be mindful of them and focus on taking Alana down with a few hit barrages. And that's exactly what I did, taking her down as her skeleton goons washed on in embarrassment. Although I forgot to get footage of me defeating her, as I wanted to save storage space by not recording when running back to the boss, and then just start recording when I start fighting the boss. But then I immediately forgot to record and kill her on that fight. <laughs> so my bad. But with Alana down... All there's left is to fight Sin, and he's right through Alduin's wall here. Sin is by far the best battle in this expansion, having not only flame breath attacks, but also being able to spray poison from his breath as well. Not only that, but Sin has some acid skin or something, as your weapon's quality will degrade very quickly with each hit on him, making the already brittle Dark Souls 2 weapons break even faster. So be sure to have some repair powder or a backup weapon on you when you fight him, as your main weapon will absolutely break over the course of this fight. Sin has all your standard dragon attacks, but the main flow of this fight comes from how Sin flies around the arena. Sin is a jumpy motherfucker, and he will often fly up and attack you before landing on the other side of the arena. Whenever he flew up, I found the best strategy was to run towards him, and that would usually cause his fireball and follow-up swoop attack to miss me. And from there, it was just rinse and repeat until he was a cooked product in a pretty fun dragon fight. I think Sin is more enjoyable than Calamite, and has better boss mechanics when he takes to the skies, with pretty good camera angles and visual clarity of him when he's above you, so you don't get any frustrating moments of trying to follow him only to get blasted by a fireball you didn't see coming. It's a very, very solid encounter. But once he's dead, we pick up this glowing red dot thing, and we get the crown of the Sunken King itself. Nice. Funnily enough, the Sunken King does not make an appearance at all in this DLC. Not even a corpse or anything. Bro is just gone. Absent. No show. What a bum. But with the crown in hand, the DLC is complete. Overall, this is a very solid package of levels with some cool mechanics and themes. Although its experience is hampered a bit by some mid to just downright bad boss battles. But Sin does make up for it a bit. 
being up to this point the best dragon fight in the series, edging out his big bro Calamy. But with that, we can move on to DLC number 2 of Dark Souls 2, The Crown of the Old Iron King. DLC number 3, The Crown of the Old Iron King. The Iron King requires a little less rigmarole to start, fortunately. All we need to do is clear the Iron Keep and kill the Old Iron King. And all we need to do is pick up a key off a body that was in front of a fire trap that was constantly on, that you later turn off near the end of the Iron Keep. After we grab the key, we go past the Iron Keep's primordial bonfire to the snake basin statue thing again, and teleport to the DLC proper. After a quick elevator ride, we pass through the fog wall to reveal Broom Tower, the setting of this DLC. And the reveal is incredible. I think Broom Tower is the most visually striking place in all of Dark Souls 2. It's definitely my favorite looking place, with these tall, half-broken towers that are capped with ash and large chains connecting them, sticking out from a cracked and lava-filled wasteland. It looks sick. Our goal here is to reach the bottom of Broom Tower, and now is probably a good time to tell the story of this place. Before the Iron King was a sluggish, mid-tier demon, he was a petty king of an even pettier kingdom, struggling for power and relevance until he met someone named Sir Alon. Alon was a powerful warrior and bolstered the Iron King's forces and trained his knights to fight like him, leaving us with the hyper-aggressive and fast alone knights that infest the Iron Keep like rats. With Alon's help and the discovery of a magic scepter that could produce iron, the Iron King built his kingdom, including the Iron Keep and Broom Tower. The Iron King, saddled with true power, like many others, folded immediately, and became a violent and extremely greedy king, mining the land to the point it got poisoned and hunting the undead for sport. He even created the Executioner's Chariot to sadistically torture the undead. Eventually, alone, probably disillusioned with the King's descent into oppressive tyranny, left the Iron King's service, which proper pissed off the Iron King, who hunted down and murdered alone, or at least forced him to commit suicide. And that takes us to the main game, where the Iron King eventually got pimp slapped into the lava surrounding the Iron Keep by the Smelter Demon, where he very fortunately landed on the submerged Lord Soul of Gwyn, and transformed into the mid-boss we all know and love to forget. <laughs> After his death, his kingdom crumbled, Broom Tower included, which began to fall apart, until another Manus Soul Fragment, Nadalia, arrived at Broom Tower seeking the Iron King, only to realize he's been dead for a hot minute. Nadalia then geeked the fuck out, creating those odd looking ashen statues to store fragments of her soul, and raised the dead of Broom Tower and enthralled them into defending her in the tower, where she remains locked down until we arrive. Broom Tower is some of Dark Souls 2 level design at its best, and sometimes worse. The place feels as tall as it looks, and much of your exploration is trying to find your way down to the bottom, which will have you weaving in and out of Broom Tower as you descend, fighting these reanimated ashen warriors and running into these weird as hell looking red glowing ashen idols that require a DLC unique item, the Smelter Wedge, to destroy. I took an embarrassingly long time to figure out how to use these things, not discovering their use until the battle with the Fume Knight, which I'm glad I did, as it's very possible to use up most of your smelter wedges before reaching the Fume Knight, and his arena has four of these things surrounding it that can heal him and make the fight exponentially harder, so don't get too overzealous with using these things. Besides the healing, the Ashen Idols can also buff enemies with Ash, making them take less damage, and can summon flame pillars to attack you. But besides the Fume Knight's idols, and the idol in the room I like to call the Gank Room, they're usually pretty easy to just ignore and run past. Speaking of the Gank Room, it is by far the worst place in Broom Tower itself. But don't worry, there's an even worse place later in the DLC. Just wait. It's a small room with three Ashen Warrior enemies, a club-wielding giant, and an Ashen Idol. And it's absolutely miserable. Above the room are explosive barrel-holding enemies and holes for them to drop down. So I thought the idea was to get the barrel carrier enemies to fall into the room and then have them blow up. But I couldn't ever get them to explode, so I'm still not sure. Also, to progress, you have to pull a lever to open the door, but for some unholy reason, the Dark Souls 2 devs decided it would be a cool and silly idea to make you vulnerable during lever pulling, chest opening, and fog wall crossing, which means you gotta clear the entire room out before progressing, which was absolutely torturous. I probably could have made it easier by destroying the idol so it couldn't ash up the other goons, but it's still such a vicious gank in here, it probably wouldn't have made much of a difference anyway. I eventually get through and open the door after some real struggling, and after getting through, I get invaded by NPC, again, on an adjacent tower, and I must have done something to really scare or spook him, as the NPC turned tail and ran down into the tower away from me. I tried to follow, but being inside the tower started to build up my curse meter, so I said screw that shit and left, and never returned. I wonder if that phantom is still down there, because it just wasn't worth it after getting spread out by the gank room. I continue descending the tower and grab the magic iron scepter from an adjacent tower and after fighting through some exploding legless enemies, their explosions being so slow and telegraphed they're very simple to avoid thankfully. 
and shove that scepter into the boom oh. tower's hole to bring the tower back to life. And the elevators start moving again, being these large, limply hanging statues that look super dope. All the design aspects of this expansion are very well done. From the central elevator area, we can access the optional Iron Pass area, which is very similar to the Cave of the Dead. Except somehow even worse. Iron Pass is filled with the Ashen Warrior enemies, archers, and these goddamn motherfucking wizard guys who are out of reach in the standard path that put a curse on you that overloads your equip load, making you walk slowly and fat roll. If you want to take these guys out, you'll have to take the alternate path that's longer than the normal path, which involves you pulling levers to progress that unleash five enemies at you at once and causes a salamander statue to shoot massive fireballs at you all the while you're trying to avoid the gang squad you just freed. It's an absolute clusterfuck, and you're better off just taking your chances on the normal fat roll road. If you manage to slog it to the fog wall, your reward is a reskinned boss from the base game. Fuck yes. This is the Blue Smelter Demon. And although he isn't necessarily a bad boss, in fact, I find Smelter Demon to be one of the better base game bosses, it's everything surrounding him that absolutely ruined this battle. The boss run is egregiously difficult and annoying, and there's almost a 100% chance he'll be taking some damage before you even square up the blue smelter demon, making the fight that much harder. Blue smelter demon also passively does damage to you from his blue burning tummy, and hits like a truck with his late game boss stats. So in order to defeat him, you'll have to have a near flawless run and fight to the boss. And with each death, and you'll be dying a lot, the run back gets more and more irritating as you get encumbered, sniped, and assaulted just trying to attempt another boss fight. It sucks. If this run back was removed, I think I probably would have enjoyed this fight if the bonfire was right next to the fog gate. But as it stands, I just simply can't enjoy it. Shit like this gives me a newfound appreciation for America's stakes and the decision to pretty much remove boss runs entirely from later FromSoft games. I wouldn't be surprised if runs like this were the reason behind this change in design philosophy. I eventually take down the blue smelted demon, using all my tricks like spamming him when he's lighting up his sword and playing as carefully as possible. I even had changed my armor so I wouldn't fat roll when cursed, and beating him felt incredible. I will never do this again. But with blue smelter demon slain, it's time to reach the bottom of Broom Tower. Once at the bottom, I destroy the Fume Knight's Ashen Idols to prep for our fight, and I find a very mercifully placed bonfire right next to the boss arena. I gotta commend the devs here. I know it must have took a lot of restraint to not put an overlong gank filled run to Fume Knight. I know that must have been hard. I appreciate it. I enter the arena to fight my pick for the boss god of Dark Souls 2, the Fume Knight. The Fume Knight, before he went by that name, was known as Sir Raim, one of King Vendrick's strongest soldiers and his number two guy next to Velstat. One day, though, Raym and Velstat got into a fight of some kind. Not sure over what, though. Maybe they were arguing about would you rather have a gay son or thaw daughter. And the debate got pretty heated. This fight caused Velstat and Raym to fall out, and Raym was banished and left Vendrick's service, eventually ending up at the Broom Tower, where he became loyal to Nadalia, guarding her at the bottom of the tower. Fume Knight is just simply the best duel in the entire game. His first phase reminds me a lot of Pontiff Sullivan, wielding a large, slow, ultra-great sword and a smaller, quicker sword. It's a great challenge in anticipation. His sword attacks are quick and can combo, but also very telegraphed, and don't do a ton of damage if you get caught. And this speed is contrasted with his Ultra Great Sword, which although slow, has such massive swing arcs, nowhere is safe from it unless you're directly behind him. And I've been caught a few times on that massive backswing, but it never felt unfair. Once you've done enough damage, he will put away his small sword and juice up his Fume Mega Sword, it now burning with fumes or something. The fumes make the hits devastatingly powerful, but also give you more visual clarity to track the sword, and it was super fun to dodge this thing and counter with my poker. This fight's got a great tempo, and there's almost a groove you can get into as you learn his moveset, and healing against him is very strategic too, as like Manus, you may have to give up attack opportunities just to heal, giving the fight another layer of challenge without feeling unfair or oppressive. It's just a fun, challenging, straightforward fight with no ganks, status effects, and no annoying hazards or brutal runbacks. Just two guys whacking each other with some sharp ass sticks. Simple as. And my pick for the best of Dark Souls 2 boss. With Fume Knight up in smoke, we can enter the doorway behind him to pick up the old iron crown and come face to face with Nadalia herself. Or at least her husk, as she looks creepy as all hell sitting on her throne of ash, slumped over with scraggly hair and gaunt extended arms. She gives me the heebie jeebies. But we're not done yet. Next, we head up to the top of the tower and find some armor with a flowing red aura around it. Interacting with the armor brings us to battle with Sir Alone who is probably the most unique boss in the entire game. He wields a two-handed katana and has a super interesting moveset, having a charge move where he sets, rushes at the player lightning fast, and swings for massive damage. 
It's a very fun attack to learn and dodge, and it's super satisfying to master the dodge timings for him. He also keeps the fight dynamic by jumping around the stage to escape, only then to rush back in with a quick gap closing stab or slash. If you get caught in his command stab, he uses our blood to power up his sword, making the fight even harder, which encourages the player to really master his dodges to beat him. Not only is the fight itself super fun, but the arena looks awesome as well. I really dig the reflective floors and the orange sky coming through the windows. It just looks awesome, and probably my favorite arena in the entire game. Also, if you defeat him without taking damage, he will do a secret animation where he will seppuku himself out of shame. But you're tripping if you think I'm that good. I'd probably give Alone the title of Best Fight in Dark Souls 2, if not for his boss run. Sir Alone is an amazing fight brought down by a dogshit boss run. The memory he resides in is full of fast, endlessly pursuing Alone Knights who could easily surround and kill you, and are very good at getting in quick hits on you. It's very unlikely that you'll be going into the Alone fight unscathed, and if not for the fact that the enemies mercifully back off once you get to the stairs right before the fog wall, this boss would be pure hell. I had done this run so many times I'd even developed my own strategy to get back most efficiently. I would hug the left wall, go inside the side hall, kill a salamander, drop down, keep hugging left and hope I don't get ganked before I reach the fog wall. It's doo doo ass cheeks. If not for this run, I'd take alone as my pick for the boss god of Dark Souls 2. But as it stands, this run to the boss keeps me from giving him the title. And Fume Knight remains on top. But once alone is killed, that's all for the crown of the Iron King. It's the ultimate mixed bag with some of the best and worst level design of Dark Souls 2 with some awesome location design and two of the best bosses in the game. But the brutally punishing boss runs and some gank choke points in the DLC keep me conflicted on it. But with that, Let's take a look at the final Dark Souls 2 DLC, The Crown of the Old Ivory King. DLC number 4, The Crown of the Ivory King. I regret everything I've done. Our final DLC, The Crown of the Ivory King, starts when you get the flower-shaped key from Dranglea Castle and use it at the Snake Basin in the Shrine of Winter. Using it brings us to the frozen kingdom of Alayam Lois, which has got to be one of the most FromSoft-ass names I've ever heard. <laughs> Alayam Alois is almost completely frozen over, and like the other DLCs, makes a great first impression, with massive ice tendrils appearing out of the frozen entrance in a big scene, and a voice warns us to go away, as the old chaos is still raging within the walls of Alayam Lois. We disregard these warnings, of course, and enter the walls. From here, we can either go left or go right. If we go left, we can try to challenge the first boss immediately, but she's invisible at the moment, so good luck trying to hit her. In order to see her, we gotta find the Eye of the Priestess which we gotta find by exploring to the right and beyond. I like this use of the level's real estate, and this expansion gets a lot out of its space. Although I do like the snowy setting, I think Alayam Lois was my least favorite DLC area to explore. It's mostly snowy stone castle walls and courtyards, and each area sort of blends together in my mind, which can lead to confusion as to where to go sometimes, and it's probably the gankiest DLC of them all, especially later on when the ice gets broken and new areas are opened up to the player. I do like the enemy designs though, there are many different types of icy slash crystallized ops, and the projectiles shooting enemies aren't as annoying as they are in other places in the game. Looking at you, shrine of a mana. But once we explore enough, we pick up the priestess's eye from a corpse on a glowing pedestal. Grabbing the eye wakes up the magic shooting enemies and allows us to take on Ava back at the front of the level. The Ava fight is probably the best beast boss in Dark Souls 2, Ava being a massive white tiger that can cast ice spells at you and summon ice spice from the ground, along with charges, bites, and swipes that a tiger would realistically do. However, I feel like this fight was a bit too easy for how far in the game I am, and I was able to take her down on my first try by dodging her slow and telegraph charges and swipes, and steering clear when I saw the ice spikes were about to pop up. Not only that, but she's a pretty big target, and easy to get behind thanks to her slow windups and recoveries, and she was just light work for me. With Ava put down, we can enter the Grand Cathedral, where we speak to the Oracle who has been summoning this massive blizzard, Alsana, and she's yet another fragment of Manus. Alsana sees that we may be able to defeat the chaos below, and breaks all the ice in Alayam Lois, unlocking new areas and enemies, really maximizing the usage of their level, which I think is pretty clever. Alsana also gives us some exposition as to what happened in Alayam Lois and the fate of the Ivory King, which is pretty rare for a FromSoft game to just come out and drop the story like that, but I appreciate it, as the other DLCs don't do as good of a job conveying their stories to the player as this expansion. We learn that Alsana had become the devoted oracle to the Ivory King despite her being the offspring of an evil darkness monster, and the Ivory King had built Alayam Lois over an ancient pit of chaos as a means to control its spread. After a while, the Ivory King felt his soul's power was waning, and went down one last time to fight the chaos, and finally succumbed to it. 
Alsana remained at her post, using ice magic and blizzards to keep the chaos subdued until we arrive, where she tasks us with finishing what the Ivory King had started and destroying the old chaos. From here, we can proceed to jump into the Chaos Chasm and fight the Ivory King. But before we fight him, we gotta fight some of his goons first. And with only one Lois Knight to back us up, we're just asking for death from the Ivory King's Royal Gang Squad at this point. So our new goal is to explore Liam Lois again to find the three other Lois Knights to back us up in our battle against the Ivory King and his thugs. We'll have to backtrack through the level and find them sitting in a chair waiting for our phone call. This trek back through Lois is much more dangerous, as new enemies like the Golems are now unfrozen and ready to join up with the local gang squads to bury our ass. We find one knight in the massive walls, another near where we picked up the eye behind a wizard invader, and one in the lower garrison past an area with Golems and rolling ice hedgehog enemies that are all waiting to quintuple team my ass. I saw these enemies standing in the snow, said oh hell no, and ran right past them. Once past the golems, we find the last Lois Knight behind another gank of icy soldiers who kill me after I wake him up, and I'm not coming back for these souls, so you guys can have them. But with all four Lois Knights at the ready, we cross the fog wall and fall way down into the old chaos in a super cool moment. I love the Dark Souls fall down a really large hole but don't take damage moment. The arena and entrance for this fight are probably some of the most bombastic out of any Dark Souls 2 boss battle. The old chaos is a really cool place fighting on an isolated platform in a sea of lava with bed of chaos looking branches overhead. Just looks fire. To get to the Ivory King, we have to first kill his goons that are coming out of these large portal mirror looking things, and these goons are either a pyromancer or are equipped with a long axe or long hammer. This fight is much more manageable with four knights to back me up, but the evil Lois knights will still primarily target you, so you'll need to have full situational awareness to make sure you'll see all incoming attacks, especially the pyromancer ones, they're the most annoying. As the fight goes on, the friendly knights will sacrifice themselves to freeze the mirrors, preventing more enemies from spawning. This is a really unique mechanic for a fight and I really like it, and has an extra sense of grandiosity to the fight, on top of being visually sweet too. This is a real war with the Ivory King. At this point, I usually have one knight left standing after all the mirrors are frozen, and the Ivory King himself makes an entrance through a Borderlands looking vault thing, and the real battle begins. I'm usually able to get a few hits in on the Ivory King as he focuses on my last remaining knight, until it's only me and him remaining. Unfortunately, I found this boss fight itself to be pretty underwhelming once it's all said and done. The Ivory King has a pretty basic moveset, mostly just some short sword combos and a few lunging strikes and stabs after he jumps away, which are easy to avoid once you learn their timings. Once you take enough health off of him, you will power up his sword, and the aura of his power-up sword expands way beyond the sword's actual length, which was a bit visually confusing for me, and led me to taking a few hits that I probably could have avoided. His new power-up seems to only give him one new move, an area of effect attack where he stabs his sword into the ground and summons ice spikes, but again, this move is no problem to avoid. The rest of his attacks are pretty much the same except for having an extended reach thanks to the elongated sword aura. But that extendo reach isn't enough to save him, and I poke the Ivory King to death, quelling the chaos. Once he's dead, we can pick up his crown, and with that, we have collected all the DLC crowns. But we're not done in Alayam Lois yet. We speak to Alsana again, who reveals that she is another fragment of Manus, and that even though the Ivory King knew she was a child of darkness, he still took her in and cared for her, giving her purpose as his oracle. What a classy guy. This story is complete here, but there's still one area of the DLC that we haven't taken a look at yet. And to get there, we need to get a key from the bowels of a gank cave, which opens an inconspicuous side door near the front of Alayam Lois. Inside, we light the bonfire and hop in this coffin and head down to the frigid outskirts. Now, remember those dog shit boss runs from the previous DLCs? Remember how annoyingly bullshit those wizards who weighed you down in the Iron Pass were? Or the Cave of the Dead having 5,000 petrifying statues shoved into one room? Or even the Alone Knight gank gauntlet? Well, all those runs can't do anything but bow in awe of the true bullshit god of Dark Souls 2, the frigid outskirts. You exit the coffin to enter the by far largest open area in the entire game, and your goal is to head west to reach the boss arena. One problem with that, 90% of the time, there's a whiteout blizzard going on, preventing you from seeing 5 feet in front of you, so you'll be wandering aimlessly for a while trying to get your bearings and figuring out where exactly you're going. While you're exploring, you'll also be endlessly jumped by infinitely respawning lightning reindeer, and you can't just ignore them. They're faster than you and will charge you down with this extremely annoying and surprisingly hard to avoid charge attack, forcing you to dispatch every deer that comes after you, dragging the boss run out to clock in at over 5 minutes per run. And the boss you're fighting? Why it's Lud and Zalin, two more of the Ivory King's shitty cats. And not only is this a gank boss, it's also a reskinned boss, copied from a boss in the exact same DLC and your reward for slogging through this borderline experimental game design is just the boss's soul for weapon transmutation. By the time I got here, 
I was exhausted from the previous expansion's brutal boss runs, and it was five minutes of frozen reindeer hell all for a reskinned gank fight, so I threw in the towel. I decided to take my one and only mulligan to not fight these reindeer-guarded pussycats. I just couldn't do it. The frigid outskirts and Ludden Zahn's fights just represent Dark Souls 2's worst aspects to me, so please forgive me for skipping them. But with Ludden Zahn ignored, that's all the Dark Souls 2 DLC is completed. All that's left to do is kill Vendrick and get his soul and crown from behind a door in the Shrine of Amana that can only be accessed in human form. Why the King's soul and crown weren't dropped by Vendrick on his death is beyond me. But with all four crowns, we return to Vendrick's memory, where he muses vaguely about the darkness and fire, and blesses the crowns, giving them the power to keep us human after dying, which prevents our health from decreasing on death too. Which is a sweet reward for sure, but it's to fix a problem that probably shouldn't have been there in the first place. Most Scholar players are probably using the ring that caps your total health loss to 75% for most of their playthrough, and I'm glad FromSoft buried this feature going forward. It just overly punishes the player for dying in a game that is specifically designed to kill you, and it feels like a band-aid for a New Game Plus playthrough. And now that that's done, it's time to move on to our only non-Souls game, Bloodborne and its Old Hunters. DLC number 5, The Old Hunters. The Old Hunters starts when you obtain the Eye of a Blood Drunk Hunter, and you have killed Vicar Amelia. Once she's dead, you can go into a corner with an amygdala in the Cathedral Ward to get picked up and transported into the Hunter's Nightmare. But you're in for some rigmarole if you start the DLC right after Amelia, as it is a fully late game expansion. You'll probably want to start it around the end of the Nightmare of Mensas, after killing Mikalash or the Wet Nurse. The Hunter's Nightmare starts as a reimagined Cathedral Ward, full of hostile hunter enemies wielding the new DLC weapons like the Beast Cutter Club that can go extendo mode and slam you from afar, and the Boom Hammer that can power up for explosive attacks and more. They're tough enemies that expose you to the new hunter weapons really well. The Hunter's Nightmare is also full of massive rounded rocks that really make use of the base level's real estate, allowing for new paths and there's a whole new Blood River area to explore, and it fits Bloodborne's design perfectly. Meaty, emaciated corpses writhe on the ground in the Blood River, and the whole place just looks so disgusting and alien with these weird rocks and graves. I really dig it. Once we've properly scoured the Hunter's Nightmare and pick up the eye pendant from the snoozing, fiery cleric beast, we enter this unassuming cave into a large blood-filled room, where we meet the greatest horse in gaming, Ludwig the Accursed. Ludwig has one of the most disgusting designs I've ever seen for a boss. He's a deformed horse with nasty mismatched limbs and an extra fucked up margua head with eyes inside the mouth, and that face. Bro needs some veneers, goddamn. Ludwig's first phase is actually pretty difficult. He's really quick with his swipes, charges, and slams. And since his model is so busy and detailed, I sometimes found it hard to figure out what attack he was going to do next. And I got distracted by the loose kicking and convulsing limbs and the flowing hair and cape he has. But I didn't have a problem with this, as his model was so incredibly grotesque, it just adds to the overwhelming feeling fighting him brings. Once he's at half health, a cutscene will play where Ludwig... Although hideously deformed and mindlessly raging and screaming like a banshee due to the corruption of all the blood he spilled on himself from a career of slaughtering beasts, notices his holy moonlight sword. And in this moment, he remembers his humanity one last time. And when the fight resumes, Lowig's demon horse form is now upright and completely calm, wielding his moonlight sword like a true hunter. Everyone gangs until the beast remembers he was once human. I love this second phase. The Moonlight Greatsword looks awesome. Its attacks and effects are super sweet, and I think this is probably my favorite version of it. Ironically though, I found this second phase much easier than the first, as I had an easier time tracking his sword swings, and Lelwig does some pretty drawn out attacks and can be heavily punished if you avoid them properly. Also, the soundtrack is going absolutely nuts, hyping you up to whoop this demon horse's ass. This expansion is also just full of great tracks. Check them out. But after some determination, getting a blood rock to max out my saw cleaver, I take down Ludwig for good, feeling like a beast myself. I don't think you could ask for a better start to this DLC. Ludwig has the fight, he has the lore, and he has one of the best second phase switch ups I've ever seen. You essentially get two boss battles in one package, and I completely understand the reverence and love people have for this fight. 
With Ludwig slain, I learned from my chat that if you wear healing church robes or clothes of people affiliated with the church, I use Gascoigne's clothes here, Ludwig's severed horse head will ask you if the church hunters are the honorable Spartans that he had hoped they would become. Does this mean Greece is confirmed real in the Bloodborne verse? If we tell Ludwig what he wants to hear, he will be relieved and will give us the holy moonlight sword from his mouth or something. Did he spit it out to us? And he goes to sleep, and we can hear him snoring if we speak to him again. Good night, sweet horseman. We proceed through this sick room looking area with multiple beds and a large statue at the back. I dispatch these two NPCs here, and I proceed to the next area by shoving the eye pendant in the head cavity of the corpse on the statue's bed. I'm not sure how my hunter knew to put that pendant there, but whatever. We ride up the statue elevator to the next area of the DLC, the research hall. Our goal here is to reach the top of the hall to move the stairs to lead to the exit. It's got a cool vertical design to its progression, but the best part about this place is the storytelling. The research hall is full of these gaunt, bag-headed freaks that flail and scream wildly at you. From both talking to some non-hostile enemies, and taking a look at the different rooms and laboratories, the research hall shows the story of how the healing church had attempted to turn patients into kin. Kin being people who have been transformed into weak great ones, the cosmic beings of the Bloodborne universe. But as we can see, this process failed for most, leaving them as deformed, bag-headed monsters. And we can hear the NPCs mention a Lady Maria, who will become important very soon. But for now, we move the stairs into place and continue on to fight the next boss, the Living Failures. The Living Failures are people who almost became Great Ones, but ultimately fell short, turning into these large, blue, deformed humanoids. And it's more of a horde battle than an actual proper boss battle, tasking you with killing around 10 of them to win. They all have a fairly basic moveset, slamming and swinging at the player like any other large enemy, and the only real attack you gotta watch out for is when they summon a large meteor storm. But it's easily avoidable by using the massive sunflower in the middle of the arena to block the falling meteors once you know what direction they're coming from. And just keep whacking the failures until their health bar is depleted, making for a pretty simple and pretty middle of the road fight. And once the failures are down, we get the astral clock tower key, and move to face the third boss pretty much right away. Lady Maria of the Astral Clock Tower. She has a fantastic entrance. Maria slumped over in her chair, the massive clock tower face behind her, bell tolling as you approach. The designers are cooking again. She appears dead, with blood beneath her. But after interacting with her, she springs to life and grabs her hand, telling me that she's got to put me down for trying to seek the truth of the hunter's nightmare. Maria is one-on-one -on -one hunter dueling at its absolute best, using lots of quick slashes and stabs to set the pace of the fight, which remains consistent throughout. Once she's down to two-thirds of health, She'll power up by stabbing herself through the chest with both of her blades. <laughs> Yo, it's gotta fucking hurt. This power up gives her slashes added blood effects that increase the damage and range of her attacks. And she adds a few new attacks like a delayed stab and a massive arcing slash. Both are tough but fair to avoid, and the effects just look sick. Once she's down to her last third of health, she powers up again, going full blood Super Saiyan and adding an extra explosive flames to her blood slashes. I love these extra flame effects in these games. It makes the enemies seem super powerful and by extension, it makes me feel like a beast for dodging and defeating these enemies. And on my second try, I down Maria. And although this battle is pretty tough, it's alleviated by Maria being pretty parryable and getting hit stunned by my saw cleaver swing sometimes, which allowed me to build up a decent chunk of extra damage on her. And although a bit on the easier side for me, I still really enjoyed this battle. Gives me some Sekiro mixed with Abyss Watchers vibe. I really like it. Killing Maria gets us the Celestial Dial, which we use to open the path to the final area of the DLC. But before that, we head back to the statue elevator, let it go up and wait for the lower statue to come up, and we pick up Lawrence's skull. This will get that slouching cleric beast to wake up and lock in to fight us. This being Lawrence himself, the founder of the healing church. His first phase is the same as the cleric beast from the base game, with some added fiery explosions to his attacks. The big change comes when he gets down to around a third of his health, where Lawrence decides that he doesn't need legs anymore and flops down, destroying his legs and dragging his stomach on the ground, spilling pools of lava from his stummy, along with spraying lava from his mouth and wildly slamming at the ground. I found this phase to be way easier than the first, actually, as the camera that usually has to swing up to see the cleric beast is now pointing down at him as he's only about as tall as the player is, and I was able to see all of his attacks coming clearly and was able to avoid them. Lawrence is also very punishable if you're out of the way of his lava spewing move, so I kept whacking him until he was dead, and all those duels with the cleric beast had finally paid off. With Lawrence put to rest, we can head to the final area of this DLC and learn the truth of what's going on, the fishing hamlet. This place fucking rules. It really leans into the Innsmouthian Lovecraftian aesthetic really well, and the dilapidated town is filled with fishy enemies, and everything is covered in barnacles and weird worms, and the place just truly feels odd, cold, dark, and wet. 
My only issue with this place is how overwhelming the large fishman enemies can be. They have this massive lunge slide attack that combos into a massive super quick flailing attack that will melt you if you're anywhere near close to it. And this led to more than a few annoying deaths, especially in the well. But besides these big bastards, this place is great. And the fishy, deep one in Zmouthy inside of Lincraftian lore is translated super well here. It's here we learn the truth of what the hunter's dream is hiding, and even learn what may have caused the start of the beast scourge of Yarnum. One day, a white, Fish-looking being named Koss washed up on the shores of the fishing hamlet, corrupting the town and transforming its residents into fish-like monsters. Although if Koss was already dead or not when she washed up is unknown. This attracted the attention of the Bergenworth scholars and the old hunters, including Maria, who had traveled to the hamlet and slaughtered its denizens, busting open their skulls looking for, quote, eyes, which in this context I believe means evidence of communication with the Great Ones. It did something to desecrate Koss's body. It's not clear what they did to Koss, whether that be extract her blood or fully dissecting her body in some way that was too grotesque. But whatever happened, it shook Maria up real bad, and she threw away her beloved Rakuyo weapon into a well, saying she can no longer stomach it, seemingly later committing suicide based on the state we find her in the Astral Clock Tower, along with no other info about how she died being present. Unbeknownst to those who went to the fishing hamlet, Koss had placed a curse on those who defiled her corpse, cursing them to get pulled into the hunter's nightmare upon death, doomed to forever hunt in a blood-driven frenzy. But the curse can be broken, as Koss was also pregnant at the time of her physical death, and her orphan child is the host of the hunter's nightmare. It's time to put the nightmare to rest, to take on one of the hardest bosses I've ever fought in a game, the Orphan of Koss. Another boss, another incredible entrance. You first go through a cave passage full of these slug-like men, all praying towards the beach. And on the beach, we see the hunter's eye moon hanging over the beach and the body of Koss, broken ship masts jutting out from the water behind it. A cutscene of the orphan crawling out from underneath Koss' body plays, the orphan looking like a pale, extremely emaciated old man. His design is subtle, yet extremely unsettling, and the fact that he looks very human makes the Great Ones feel even more alien and mysterious. The orphan then stares at the moon until you get close, and then the fight begins. The orphan fights with his own placenta. <laughs> Fucking disgusting. That has a sharpened hard edge to it. And he's a screamer too. With each attack, he'll be hollering like a torture victim. I have these screams and hollers seared into my ears from how many times I had to fight this guy. <laughs> His placenta can also extend for wide-ranging hits, giving the orphan a ton of range. He also often jumps up to slam down with an attack or to quickly reposition, keeping you constantly locked in. He can be parried, but I found the parry windows to be extremely tight and inconsistent, and a lot of failed parries led to a lot of extra hits from Orphan's meat club. The best way to get crits on Orphan is to visceral his back, which staggers him. But the timing windows are super tight and require elite positioning to get behind him at just the right time. As he isn't much of a lone soldier, he really has his back to you. So take advantage when he does. He also has the ability to grab a ball of meat from his placenta and throw it at you, which explodes on impact for some big damage, as well as generating an area of effect blast for an alternate attack. This first phase is pretty hard on its own, forcing you to master all his barrages of attacks and ranged swings, but the second phase really jacks up the difficulty from around an 8 to a 12. He sprouts some fleshy flowing wings and begins attacking even faster and harder, and his jump attacks are now massive. Orphan will be dashing and flying all over the arena in his second phase. And his second phase also comes with his worst attack. He now throws multiple exploding meatballs at you while soaring around the arena like a fly on speed. And I've had a few annoying deaths where I was a bit close to the wall, and Orphan landed and one shot at me with his meatball shower, and those were the only deaths that genuinely annoyed me, as I would be having such a solid run and then BOOM! Lost 90% of my health and died in one hit because I was too close to the wall. Which I got too close to because I was too focused on keeping track of Orphan and his movements. Not ideal. That, and Orphan's attack where he summons down lightning was another move I wasn't a fan of, as it hard forces you to disengage Orphan and dodge the lightning, breaking the flow of the battle. My strat to avoid the lightning was to just run back to the fog wall, as the lightning wouldn't reach the wall, and just dodge Orphan if he goes in for an attack while locked off. I think besides Melania, Phase 2 Orphan might be the hardest FromSoft boss of all time, and it felt downright overwhelming at times. 
I was trying every advantage I could get and used all my beast bub pellets and bolt papers to try to get any advantage, which is rare for me as no other FromSoft boss has pushed me to this brink before, which has made the victory that much sweeter. After almost two hours of getting meat clubbed to death by this motherless freak and multiple trips to the Mensis Nightmare to restock my blood vial supply, I finally got him, giving this orphan the spanking he deserves. Just a fantastic and very rarely annoying experience. I've never felt more accomplished in killing a FromSoft boss, an orphan is a brutally fantastic inclusion to this beast of an expansion. With orphan dead, it's time to kill this nightmare. And to do that, we have to attack this little black wisp that's coming out of Koss's cadaver. This is the orphan's spirit, and severing it from Koss seems to please her. And Koss lifts the curse and ends the hunter's nightmare. It's unclear why killing the orphan satisfies Koss, but my interpretation is that the orphan had become trapped in the hunter's nightmare after Koss's defilement, as the scholars and hunters were unaware that Koss was pregnant, and the orphan was stuck in the nightmare as a sort of limbo, fueled by rage of the humans that killed its mother. But once he's slain and the spirit attacked, the orphan has been freed, and is now able to traverse the cosmos, or wherever the hell great ones go. And we can also examine Koss's body, and her head seems to have a human face kind of poking out of it. Creepy. But with that... That's the Old Hunters Complete, an overall fantastic package from beginning to end, containing some of the three best bosses in the game that still have such legendary status among fans today, and all the levels are super unique and interesting, and there's a ton of new weapons to use, including the Holy Moonlight Greatsword and many others. It's just an excellent package, and a must-have for any Bloodborne playthrough. But enough blood, it's time to soul up again and take a look at our final game, Dark Souls 3. DLC number 6, Ashes of Ariandel. Dark Souls 3 was the first Souls game I ever played and completed, so I have a bit of a biased fondness for it. It is my personal favorite Souls game, and I feel it has the best gameplay in the series by a country mile. But that gameplay ain't worth shit if the levels and bosses suck. So let's take a look at our first of two Dark Souls 3 DLCs, The Ashes of Ariandel. To start Ashes of Ariandel, you must first reach the Cathedral of the Deep and meet Slave Knight Gale next to a bonfire. Gale is a slave knight, who were soldiers conscripted as fodder in the massive battles between kingdoms of the Dark Souls universe. And despite the job hazards, Gale managed to survive, or at least come back from, every single battle he was sent to die in, doing this for an untold amount of years. Eventually, he came into the service of a certain painter, a painter being someone who has the ability to paint new worlds into existence by using elements from the real world, such as blood and fire. These worlds are usually made for people and creatures who have no place in the main world and tries to be a safe haven for them. This expansion takes us to the Painted World of Ariandel, a successor to Dark Souls 1's Painted World of Ariamis level. Gale wants us to help out the painter and to create a new Painted World, which requires burning away the current one and starting over, as like the main world. The Painted World is cyclical, as the painting eventually rots away after enough time passes. One problem with that though, another Ashen One, a woman named Sister Frida, has seemingly usurped control of the painted world, and refuses to let the painter burn away the world to create a new one, seemingly content to wait and watch the current painted world rot away, which is how we find the painted world when we get sucked into it through a scrap of it Gale has with him. And don't forget about Gale, by the way. He will return. When we enter, we can talk to this rather horrifying individual in a corner full of bulbous worm-like growths, who tells us to go find a rotting bed to die in, signaling the rough shape this place is in. Like Ariamis, Ariandel is also a snowy landscape of high cliffs and ruins. I enjoy how wide open the place is, giving the player plenty of space to explore and learn the new enemy types that inhabit the painting. You start fighting these Farron followers, to wolves, to a massive wolf that can charge like a damn bullet shot out of a gun, to these weird tree ladies, to the Viking druid hybrid Millwood knights that are pretty tough to take down. And these guys took more than a few deaths off of me. And this area where a lot of them are jammed into is an absolute wash trying to traverse, as you can aggro several of these guys onto you at once as archers shoot explosive arrows down on you from the tower. And I just ended up running through the area to pick up the items and immediately bugged out of there. And after that, we continue on to reach a sweet looking vista of the Chapel of Ariandel and cross this sketchy ass bridge. Ariandel carpentry looks pretty lacking. After crossing the bridge, we meet this edgy looking knight at the front door of the chapel, who is confused at our arrival, as we are not a purposeless Dark Soul Society reject, but he tells us to speak to Frida to get back home. We enter the chapel and meet Frida herself, sitting in the corner of the chapel, rocking a nun fit with a hood that covers her eyes. I'm not quite sure how FromSoft characters can see with their eyes always covered like this. Frida isn't exactly happy to see us, asking us why we're here as we aren't a forlorn creature and currently do have a purpose to go hunt down and put the Lords of Cinder's skulls on their chairs as an unkindled ashen one, and she tells us to go fuck off and use the bonfire to bug on out of here. 
If you talk to her again, she even bribes you with a chill bite ring to get you to bounce. But Ash and One don't care. And we continue on towards the Corvian Settlement. The Corvian Settlement is a place I find super interesting. First off, it's absolutely fucking disgusting. It's inhabited by these scrotal, emaciated bird-like people who seem to be dragging a hairy and frozen mass of either poop or rotten intestines from their lower bodies. Their designs are so fucking nasty. <laughs> who are so weak and rotted, their only attack that they can muster is a nasty poison vomit move. The villages run down and overgrown with the red worm-like growths, and the buildings themselves look wounded and infested with worms. And we can even talk to one of these Corvians, who begs us to burn the world away and end his miserable existence, which I totally understand. This place is fucking rancid, and needs a fire bath ASAP. In this settlement, there are even more tough enemies, the Corvian Knights, who can attack the player with super quick flurries and can grab you for massive damage, and they aggressively attack the player, making going for a heal a dangerous move when engaged with these guys. They don't play. I think I genuinely feared them, and they have a super dope design. The Corvian settlement is giving Bloodborne a run for its money in terms of disgusting visual design. Once through the village and past the graveyard, we enter this building to find Sir Vilheim, assumingly here to kill us on behalf of Sister Frida, yapping about how I can't handle the truth of this place or something. But does this guy know who he's talking to? Bro, I killed Blue Smelter Demon. You're light work. <laughs> but I will say... Wilhelm does have some skill to back up his talk, and he even applies some black flame to his sword, which is some nice foreshadowing for later. Upon his death, he calls Frida by her real name, Elfrida, one of the founding members of the Sable Church, a faction in the base game that's tied to Yuri of Londor's quest and the usurpation of fire ending in the base game. Wilhelm drops a key that allows us to use this lever, which drops a staircase to the attic, where we can meet the painter Gale is working for, who is a young girl sitting on top of a table. She recognizes us as the unkilled Ashen warrior that Gale had recruited to help her, and she asks us to show her flame in order to create her new world. Which may be a difficult task to do in this frozen wasteland. She then returns to the Ariandel Chapel, in front of the unfinished canvas. From here, we can loop back around and enter an amazingly disgusting dungeon full of worms and overgrown flies that are a bit more annoying to fight than expected, as they can grab you and infest you with worms that build up blood loss several times. And there's also approximately 8 million of them down in this fucking dungeon. It's down here that we can also pull a crank to open up the path to the final boss. But first, let's go take on this expansion's only other boss, the Champion Gravetender. To get to him, we gotta knock down this rickety ass bridge to create a ladder to the bottom of the ravine. And it's always fun to do this in Souls games. And after slipping and falling to my death several times, I reach the bottom and hop into the sweet looking boss arena. But that's probably the best part of this fight. This fight is almost another non-boss. Just being a human NPC and a great wolf enemy that joins in after you take off two thirds of the Gravetender's health. The Gravetender is light work, being no different than any other hostile NPC, and the only thing you really have to worry about is the wolf's attacks as you finish off the Gravetender, as the wolf loves to use his icy, faster than light supercharge, often multiple times in a row. But there's a lot of pillars in the arena to break up that charge. But besides that, this fight is simple and underwhelming, mostly existing as a barrier of entry into the hollow arena, but I'm not taking a look at any of the PvP stuff in this video, as I don't play PvP much myself, so this is mostly just to check him off my boss hit list. And with the Gravetender dead and the fly-infested sewer crank pulled, it's time for the main event of this DLC, the fight with Sister Frida. We entered the now open chapel room to find a massive man hunched over a large bowl of some sort. This is Father Ariandel, the namesake of the world itself. And Ariandel is bolted down to this stool, constantly watching a small fire in his bowl. And if the fire starts flaring up to burn the world away, Ariandel will flail himself to put out the flame with his own blood. <sighs> Fucking brutal. Father Ariandel's body has fallen into some serious decay. Seriously, bro is gaunt, and his face looks like a deformed and rotting corn cob. He looks like he needs a serious flame bath too. But then, Freed approaches us from behind, now wielding a massive scythe. And Miyazaki made the boss call, and we get the biggest reveal of the DLC. Frida isn't wearing shoes, or socks. <laughs> you fucking dog. She tells Ariandel to avert his eyes from the incoming slaughter, and we square up. Our fight with Sister Frida is one of the hardest in the entire series, and she's in full control of the tempo, and your success will come from learning how to counter her deep bag of moves. It took me a while to figure out her disappearing moves and stance moves. The disappearing move is definitely bound to shred you up a few times as you try to figure it out. She can either jump up or to the side. If she jumps up, she will always land directly behind you, so it's pretty easy to find her if she does this. If she jumps, just turn around 180 degrees and start walking, and she should reappear. If she jumps to the side, my strategy was just to see which way the snow was pointing, and then follow that line until she reappeared. 
but it wasn't foolproof, and I still got snatched up a few times. Her attacks also have several delays and combos to catch you off guard, and she has a deep, deep bag of special moves after stancing up with her scythe. She can do a quick spin, kick up ice, or do a scythe drag that can grab you for massive damage. The only real break you can catch in this phase is that you can get in some sword combos in if you correctly counter her swings or get her out of position. But these moments are rare. She's pretty hard to catch when repositioning. She's got a super bloodborne dodge thing going, and she's kind of floating all over the arena. And once you take her down, that's just act one. Ariandel, seeing his queen's blood leak to his bowl, flies into an incel rage, slamming his bowl in a rage and even breaking out of his restraints, but still being tied down to his chair, which is a design motif I really like. It makes him seem even more deranged and crazy. Frida also revives, embered up alongside him, and we enter phase two. Ariandel's raging and fire has doubled the size of the arena for phase two, and I really like this damage. It feels as if the fight is destroying the very fabric of the painted world itself, and it's making me feel like we're two gods fighting for the fate of this world. Frida and Ariandel share a health bar, thankfully, and my strategy was to focus on hitting Ariandel, as his windows are much larger and his attacks are much easier to dodge, while Frida takes a more passive role, usually kicking up massive ice AoEs to keep us off Ariandel that you always have to be mindful of. Frida will also attempt to heal their health bar at least once, so be sure to be ready when she goes in for the heal. Usually she'll be able to heal a bit and extend the fight because she'll disappear and get pretty far away to start healing. But besides that, just watch out for the floor being turned into ice spikes and keep the pressure on Father Ariandel and they should go down soon enough. And you'll even get a Titanite Slab for your victory. But even with the Titanite Slab, it's still not over. They're tricking you. We hear Ariandel's voice before Frida rises yet again and goes full Black Flame Super Saiyan. This is some Sister Frida Ashes Die Thrice type shit. And she opens with a massive jumping Black Flame Blast that shoots a column of it at you. Dodge viciously to the side to avoid this attack. And now we're at the third phase. Black Flame Frida. Frida will whip out a smaller Ice Scythe to complement her Black Flame Scythe where she can generate ice and black flame AoEs, trails, and attacks. The effects are going nuts in this phase. On top of the massive amount of ice and flames, this is a more oppressive phase one. Freyda's combos start getting longer than the Lord of the Rings director's cut, and she still has her old moves like the disappearing jump, which at this point I had gotten so good at countering that using that move actually made the fight easier, as if you find her you can get some free hits in. I played completely reactively to this battle, only swinging in combo openings, which mercifully can be broken up with hits that break Frida's poise, double hand and straight sword and too strong. And with enough patience and not choking, I finally took her ass down, and this fight pissed me off immensely. But I still think I love it. It's an absolute endurance, and it took me around six and a half minutes to beat all three phases in one go, and it's just incredibly satisfying to accomplish. And the main reason I actually play this DLC, Champion Gravetender and his shitty dog sure ain't cutting it. The boss isn't even too difficult between phases one and two, but having to defeat Black Flame Frida on top of those two phases makes it an Iron Man-like experience, and is one of my favorite fights in Dark Souls 3. I should have known Miyazaki would be cooking on this fight when she came in with the dogs out. <laughs> well done. But with Frida killed, a new bonfire to the Dreg Heap spawns in, and we can use it to travel to our final DLC, The Ringed City. DLC number 7, The Ringed City. We've made it. The final chapter in the Dark Souls story. Crazy journey it's been. From Manus to Gang Squad, it's all been leading here. The Ringed City doesn't actually start in the Ringed City though, rather starting in the Dreg Heap. The Dreg Heap is a mysterious, massively destroyed place on the edge of the world. All past kingdoms converging in the same place, with impossible ruins jutting out from all angles, half buried in piles of ash, with a glowing eclipse hanging in the sky. It's so awesome. This place is fucked. Nobody does destruction in ruins like FromSoft. I find this place so inherently fascinating. I can't even tell what's going on. If these are real ruins or some crazy warp of time overlapping in on itself, it truly feels like the end is near. We can talk to this hollow pilgrim before entering, who is perched up watching the world crumble, saying it makes her feel like a god, and her dialogue sets a great tone going forward. We proceed by following messages from Gale, who has gone to the Ringed City in search of blood of the dark soul for the painter, the last material she needs to paint her new world. His specter points us down some massive but safe falls, and we fall safely onto a mound of ash. We are then attacked by a new enemy, the Butterfly, a hollow looking creature with large white wings that shoot laser barrages at me. I think these designs are so sick. The butterflies look so fucking weird and out of place, even for a Dark Souls game. And it's super fascinating. The world is so old and broken and warped that people are turning into these otherworldly angel creatures. It's so cool. 
even if their laser barrages kind of get a little annoying later on. We also fight these weird abyssal dregs and these massive headless knights, and we learn how to take the butterflies down by killing their fleshy pod counterparts. Another great disgusting design here too. We soon make it to the fallen ruins of the earthen peak from Dark Souls 2, which is a cool touch. And from here, there are two more areas with butterflies shooting you with its wing lasers. And I was having trouble in the swamp area. The desert pyromancer NPC was dog walking my ass. Her fan attack seems to stun me if hit. And I was still stunned by the time the second hit came around, which comboed me for massive damage that killed me an embarrassing amount of times. And I only beat her because she walked off the cliff and died after killing me. That's probably the biggest bailout I've ever gotten from a Souls game. But once she's dead and the nearby butterfly cocoon killed, I gather up all the items I can find and head to the edge of the earthen peak and take another souls patented massive fall into the boss room through a massive hollow tree, mirroring the burnt ivory king fight. There's a lot of DS2 references going on in the drag heap. And it's here I take on the first boss of this DLC, the Demon Prince. This boss is another endurance test like Frida, forcing you to deplete three health bars to kill him. First, you must fight two identical demons, the demon in pain and the demon from below. And although this fight is a gank, it has a very clever design to it. One demon will be glowing with fire, and the other one won't be. The demon glowing with fire will be aggressive, charging the player and swinging at them, while the other demon will be more passive and spray poison from afar. And as the fight goes on, the demons will power up and power down, swapping their roles. I think this fight works really well. It makes the fight much more dynamic, and it will provide clear visual cues as to how you will be attacked so you can react accordingly. It still felt kind of overwhelming at times, when the aggressive demon was swinging at me through the model of the passive demon, but that's mostly my fault for greedily attacking the passive one and disregarding the other. Once you kill both of the demons, the last one you kill will reignite as the demon prince, and hearing about how Lorian defeated him in the base game, it's super cool to finally face off against him in person. The demon prince attacks you similarly to the first phase, but now has several pyromancies to throw at you. The worst one being this attack where he spews a massive fireball that then turns into fiery meteors. I had no clue how to properly avoid this attack, and when he started making the fireball I would just run away and then spam dodge when the meteors came after me, hoping I wouldn't die. Luckily, he will only do this move twice, and you should be able to get away with it if you spam dodge and make sure your health is near full when it starts. He will also chuck fireballs, conjure fire spewing orbs, and gets a lot more air with his attacks that also have a fiery explosion added to the end of them. He's just all around more aggressive and on the move, and he's got a thousand ways to burn your ass to a crisp. It's one hell of a fight. Luckily, we can catch a break by staggering him and then stabbing his head for massive damage. And that's how I ended up killing him, blade to brain. And with the demon prince slain, the path to the ringed city is open. And also with his death comes the death of the demon race in the Dark Souls universe. Yep, we just exterminated the entire demon race. You see, demons were created before Dark Souls 1 by the Chaos Flame, a flame the Witch of Izalith attempted to create in order to replace the first flame. But she fucked up, and the Chaos Flame went wild, turning the Witch into the bed of chaos that the demon spawned from. But as we know, the Chaos Flame and the bed of chaos are long gone, and no more demons can be made. And as the ages of fire rose and fell, the demon population kept thinning out over time, until only the two demons in the giant tree remained. And when we slay them, the collective memory of the demons gathers together and revives the demon prince in one last attempt to save the demons and reignite the chaos flame. But uh, looks like that ain't happening now. And I really love this aspect of the story. It really adds to the finality of this DLC's theming. After that, we get a lift from those white brain demons who take us to the Ringed City, mirroring how we got to Honor Orlando in Dark Souls 1. And we finally arrive. The Ringed City was a city made for the pygmy lords at the edge of the world. Lordom time. Now, I'm not exactly sure if humans and pygmies are the same thing or not in the Dark Souls universe, as according to the lore, all humans descend from the furtive pygmy, and in the real world, pygmies are a type of human, but I'm not 100% sure. During Gwyn's war with the Everlasting Dragons, the pygmy lords and their human warriors were forcefully conscripted into battle, donning their marked ring and knight armor branded with the dark sign, as the humans were able to use the power of the dark to create almost living weapons and draw power from it which is antithetical to the gods' affinity to fire. Despite their integral role in the war, after their victory, Gwyn likely didn't want the world to know that he had gotten help from the darkness, or maybe he wanted all the credit for the victory, so he came up with a plan. He built the Ringed City for the pygmy lords and humans at the edge of the world, and gave them his daughter Filianor to suspend time around the Ringed City by having her sleep with this egg thing. This way, Gwyn could appease, or at least pretend to appease the pygmies while containing them in their nasty-ass dark soul to a city at the edge of the world and the records of their contributions to the war were wiped from history, 
which is where we come in. This first area of the Ringed City looks fantastic. A large curved bridge to your right and the Ringed City itself in the background to the left. I really like the look of the Ringed City. Its grass covered grounds and vertical design gives it a Hanging Gardens of Babylon type vibe that I really like. I just wish we could even see more of this place, as we mostly just get to admire it from a distance. On the bridge, several Dark Souls 2 ruined sentinel type red ghosts appear to spray me down with arrow fire. Huh. Even more Dark Souls 2 references. There's plenty of cover to take at the beginning of the bridge, and a lucky phantom showed me the side path to drop down to to safely progress across the bridge. So, thanks whoever you are. And I get up on the other side of the bridge and take down the super tall robed guy summoning the archers. I also really like these guys' designs. They're fucking huge and extremely gaunt, and they're kind of unsettling to look at, but in a good way. They just look so... uncanny. Once past the bridge, we meet a preacher locust, a disgusting half-man, half-fly creature with a massive bug ass. I hate bugs, so these guys are absolutely revolting to me, but also incredibly fascinating. They speak ominously about the coming dark and are voracious, ending their dialogue with a let the feast begin line. We can see this feast in action if we get grabbed by one later on, as they will skewer you and chomp on you. So fucking nasty. Please die. From here we reach the first bonfire and enter the ringed city proper, and fight with some ringed knights. They have some super sweet armor with the glowing dark side on their chest and this gothic edgy hood. Their weapons can be imbued with fire for extra range and damage, and the effects look sweet. From soft are really flexing their design skills here. I then run into these shelled summoner enemies, and they're definitely the most annoying enemies to fight, summoning AoEs to damage you and their shells can block your sword swings at times. Just a bit of a hassle to deal with, but it's super fun to knock them over and slaughter them, and the animations are pretty funny. We then reach the main street of the DLC, and at the top we can talk to a door. And the lady behind it will ask us to kill Medir, the local dragon who is slowly becoming consumed by the power of the abyss that he has sworn to fight off. Just watch out when talking to her. There's a roving gang squad of large headless knights that are coming up the stairs and can start scrapping with you mid-conversation. These guys are probably the worst gank in this expansion, as they seemingly respond from the muck at the end of the road infinitely, so they mostly just force you to stay off the street or just run right past them. I'd rather patrol the Mojave than take on several of these guys at once for some extra souls. Past the street is a muck-filled open area infested with the Bugmen, who attack with glowing sticks and have a really creepy line when trying to grab you. Rancid, rancid vibes from these bastards. Please die. I then tried taking on these ringin knights on the ruin, but they all aggro on me at once to start a 1v3 gank squad, so fuck that. You can also go to the far left of this area to do a rematch with Dragon Slayer Armor to take his clothes. Having the boss just kind of be out in the open like this reminds you a lot of Elden Ring when you start running into former bosses out in the field. I see the foundations for that design here a little bit. Past this area, we enter a decrepit tower in a cave area where Medir shows up to spew flames all over our neck, chests, and down our throats. Ugh. I run past him and climb up this tower, which never fails to confuse me as to where I'm going. You fall down holes to climb back up, and I always lose track of where I am in here. But eventually, I reach the top. Medir comes back to try to roast me again. If you want to fight Medir, you first have to damage him enough in this spot so he falls down into his boss arena. It's a bit crusty. Medir takes up the entire area you can fight him in, and he has massive swings and breath attacks that can kill you to death, especially when he gets low on health. He'll unleash a massive barrage of breath and slam attacks that I miraculously dodge by divine intervention or something. I seriously have no idea how he missed me here. But with some elbow grease and some determination, I'm able to kick him down his hole. From here, we can proceed towards the church and fight a dual greatsword wielding ring and knight in a pretty cool mini boss type encounter. This dude's quicker than you think. And we enter the church to take on the next boss, Half Light, Spear of the Church. Half Light is not really a boss, he's a summon boss. But since I highly doubt anyone was running Half Light in the Ringed City in late 2023, I just got the default NPC to fight. He's got some cool sorceries and clothes, and gets back up from the Painting Guardians from Dark Souls 1. But this is pretty much just a hostile summon. A basic red phantom. I wish we fought the massive Judicator Argo instead. Maybe you could have whipped out two massive swords and went ham on our ass. But he just exists to summon Half-Light, which is apparently so fucking strenuous he falls over dead after summoning him. <laughs> well, whatever. I batter Half-Light to death and tear him to take down Medir, a real man's boss. Medir is the secret optional boss of this expansion. He success through a hidden path on an elevator that opens the shortcut at the second bonfire, where you fall down another massive drop into the boss room. Madeira was a fight that I really came around on. At first, I felt kind of deflated trying to fight him. His attacks are massive and he's constantly on the move, giving you little opportunity to attack. Also, everywhere besides his head is armored up, and it's pretty futile to try to attack anything but his noggin, as he was crushing and blowing my ass up. 
until I realized the intention of the fight, as this is mostly a fight about positioning. To win, you'll need to stay in front of Madeira pretty much all times, as getting behind him or to the side of him leaves you wide open for massive breath attacks. You need to stay in front of him and keep whacking his head and get out of the way when he does a breath attack. I really like his one breath attack where it goes from a fire to a beam of abyssal energy. It reminds me a ton of Godzilla's nuclear breath beam and the effects and subsequent explosions look awesome. But once you get familiar with his moves and know how to steer clear of his breath attacks, you just gotta stay locked in, bonking this gator-like dragon on the head until he gets staggered. And once he's staggered, the fight is pretty much over. You can crit him for some massive damage, and then one or two swings later, Dark Eater Madeira is now Dirt Eater Madeira. Madeira is probably my favorite dragon fight in the entire Soul series. And learning to stay in front of him and giving him that sweet head staff felt amazing. What a great fight. We can then return to the Door Lady for our reward of another Titanite slab. Sweet. But with that, all that's left is to go see Filionor, who we find at the top of the church, snoozing with some cracked looking egg thing. We touch the egg, which then immediately crumbles, and a massive light washes out the screen. And when we return, we find Filionor dead, turned into a beef jerky hollow. The camera then zooms out to reveal a massive sandy wasteland, the ringed city completely gone, with only a few ruins jutting out from the dunes, with Lothar Castle in the distance. It seems that the suspension of time has been broken, and that we've been transported into the future, or maybe the present? Where the ringed city had been long since destroyed and buried beneath the sands of time. At least I think. I'm not too sure if time has passed or if this is the real state of the ringed city, but time here is convoluted after all. So who knows? After exiting Philia Jerky's room, we see a small pygmy lord crawling along the ground, slowly making his way to Philianor, saying that Red Hood has come to eat them and drink their dark soul-infused blood. Our fears are confirmed when we reach the ruins of the Hall of the Pygmy Lords, where we find a hulked-up Gale bent over, feeding on the corpse of a pygmy lord. Like I mentioned earlier, Gale came here to obtain the dark soul for the painter, which could be found in physical form as the blood of the pygmy lords, the inheritors of the dark soul. However, by the time Gale had arrived, the pygmies had been so long lived that their blood had completely dried up, unable to be used as material. Gale, in despair, then began devouring the pygmy lords in a frenzy, morphing him into the beast we find him as. Gale then demands our own dark soul, and we begin our final duel. Gale has the best setup for a fight in the entire series. Two warriors, one a slave knight, the other unkindled ash, dueling at the edge of the world amongst the rubble of everything. No gods remain. The pygmies are devoured, the demons are extinct, the dragons are gone. The world is covered in a wasteland of ash, the result of the unnatural extension of the Age of Fire. It's so sweet. This is it, baby. And the fight itself is just... Oh, my God, it's just, it's just a blast. His attacks are so fun to dodge. There's just a great flow to the fight. Gale gives you plenty of windows to heal. So this is a battle of the last two people on Earth viciously trading blows. And I really enjoy this sort of more drawn out but more forgiving pace of the battle. It really feels like we're both giving it our all. This is also my favorite boss arena, as the whole area is wide open to be fought in, and Gale will chase you down like a dog to start the fight. This open area just lets the fight flow completely freely. Once he's down to half health, Gale starts bleeding onto his sword. His pygmy feast has allowed his blood to become imbued with the power of the Dark Soul. He powers up with his red aura, and his cape comes to life. The second phase is even better. Gale stands up, and I actually like how you can see his eyes and nose outlined through his red hood. It gives him an almost demonic presence. And now all of his attacks are followed up by a swing of his cape, which has been imbued with evil red dark soul power, adding a ton of visual flair to the fight, which FromSoft seems to love to do. He starts attacking from the air much more often, coming at you like a missile. He'll also start shooting you with an automatic crossbow, as well as emitting red projectiles and summoning down lightning. The lightning was the only part of the fight that annoyed me, as I got one annoying death from it after I got struck while backing away from Gale. But besides his lightning, I have no complaints with this fight whatsoever. It's epic final, and most of all, it's fun. And it's a worthy final boss for this series. Using the Hollow Slayer Greatsword, I get the best of Gale, and with his death, we're able to get the blood of the Dark Soul, Gale being the final sacrifice needed to get everything the painter needed to start her new world. And with Gale dead, our business in the Ring City is done. Unfortunately, there's no end cutscene or anything to round out the end of the story, which really isn't a complaint, it's just me being greedy because I wanted to learn more about this fascinating place. We return to the painter and give her the blood to start working on her new world. She asks us our name, and she says she will name her new world after us. So, I hope the painter world of Sherm will be a nice place to stay. And with that, that's the end of the Ringed City and the Dark Souls series itself.
I really, really like this expansion. From the Drag Heap to the Ringed City and the Destroy Worldly Fight Galen, this expansion has some of the best visual and character designs in the entire series. And the bosses here are awesome, except for one, providing some of the most well-designed, hardest, and yet most fun bosses to fight in the entire Soul series. A very, very solid package. And that's all the DLC is complete. And you know what time it is. Time to rank these bastards. And then, we'll do a quick ranking of the bosses. Let's get it. In 7th place, in the bottom DLC of the pack, we've got the Crown of the Ivory King. It's just the weakest DLC in my opinion. Bosses are underwhelming to downright shit. Alayam Lois has a cool winter theming in enemies, but starts becoming a ganky slog towards the end. And whoever designed the frigid outskirts should be fined for violations against game design. All these combined to make me put it here. And in 6th place, in the second worst, we've got Crown of the Sunken King. A Crown of the Sunken King has some really solid level designs and some great visual presentation. Sin is a really solid dragon fight, even being better than Calamite. But the other bosses are either mid or just downright ass cheeks. And the fairly minimal lore and story don't really help this one either, making me place it here. And in third place, in the best of the Dark Souls 3 DLCs, we got the Crown of the Old Iron King. It's just the best Dark Souls 2 DLC for having two of the best bosses in the game, plus Broom Tower being a super awesome place with some pretty clever design. But it's bogged down by brutal boss runs and some ganky choke points for me. A lot of peak asshole design decisions going on here. And one of the three bosses being a copy from the base game. Makes me put it here. In fourth place, we've got Ashes of Ariandel. Even though it only has two bosses, one boss is pretty much a one in three battle, and one of the best bosses in the series in my opinion, and it has some awesomely disgusting areas and enemies, and a decent amount of open area to explore, but its lack of content and its only other boss being not much of a boss at all, makes me put it here, in the middle of the pack. And in third place, we've got the OG Artorius of the Abyss. It's just an excellent start to the From Software DLCs. Two of the best and most difficult bosses in Dark Souls 1 and some super memorable locations like Ulysseal and the Chasm of the Abyss provides an excellent supplementary package to any Dark Souls 1 experience. And I highly recommend you play through this on every playthrough of Dark Souls 1. Great job. And in second place, we've got the Ringed City. It's just simply the second best pack. It's got great locations in the Dreg Heap and the Ringed City itself. It's got some really interesting lore that expands the universe right at the very end, and three of the best bosses in all of Dark Souls 3 to fight, and plenty of well-designed and interesting enemies and places to explore. And it's just a great send-off to the Soul series, capping the expansion off with a god-tier final fight, which lets me put it here. And in first place in the DLC god of the From Software catalog is... The Old Hunters. The Old Hunters is almost a perfect package. Ludwig, Marie, and Orphan are some god-tier fights, both in gameplay and story, and have some great levels like the Fishing Hamlet and the Research Hall that expand on the Lovecraftian cosmic horror amazingly. And there's a hall of new weapons to use, and it's only prevented from perfection by one mid-boss and some pretty insane difficulty spikes at times. But besides that, this is the perfect companion a Bloodborne copy could ask for. It's essential even, and it's my pick for the best From Software DLC. And now it's time to rank the bosses. And I'll make this quick. In 24th place, we have the worst boss, and that is Lud and Zolland. Just, just no. And in 23rd place, we have the second worst boss, Gang Squad. Just, just, just why? And in 22nd place, we've got the Blue Smelter Demon. It's just too much. Again, why? And in 21st place, we have Half-Light, Spear of the Church. It's just a hostile NPC. Pretty lame. And in 20th place, we've got the Sanctuary Guardian. It's just too easy. And in 19th place, we've got the champion Grave Robber and his shitty dog. It's not really a boss, and also kind of lame. And in 18th place, we've got the Living Failures. It's more of a horde fight than an actual boss fight, and is a little too easy coming off guys like Ludwig. And in 17th place, we've got Ilana, the Squalid Queen. Pretty underwhelming fight. Pretty much a Nishandra clone with the power of gank. And in 16th place, we have Ava, the King's Pet. Very cool design, but a little bit too easy. And in 15th place, we have the Burnt Ivory King. Has a great spectacle and setup, but the fight itself is pretty mid and not that interesting. And in 14th place, we've got Lawrence the First Vicar. He's got a cool and kind of brutal second phase, but he's still a cleric beast at the end of the day. And in 13th place, we've got Black Dragon Calamite. A decent dragon fight, but a little bit crusty and primitive. In 12th place, we've got Sin the Slumbering Dragon. He's a better fight than Calamite, and is much better to fight while in the air. Not a fan of his acid skin, though. And in 11th place, we've got Sir Alon which is a great battle bogged down by a dog shit boss run. And in 10th place, we've got Artorius of the Abyss. He's got great lore and presentation and a much more aggressive fighting style than the base game bosses. 
but he was a bit too on the easy side for me. And in ninth place, we've got the Demon Prince, which is an actual good gank fight with some pretty awesome lore at the end, and also some really great effects and wild looking attacks. And in eighth place, we've got Lady Marie of the Astral Clock Tower. It's a peak hunter battle with some awesome effects and attacks, but again, a bit on the easy side. And in seventh place, we've got Madeir. He's simply the best dragon in the series. Overwhelming, but very beatable. And then in sixth place, we've got the Fume Knight. He's simply the best fight in DS2. I bow to the DS2 god. And in fifth place, we've got Ludwig. Awesome lore and a super challenging fight. And the two phases are so unique from each other, it's pretty much two fights in one. In fourth place, we've got Manus, Father of the Abyss. He's the ultimate Dark Souls 1 challenge and the most engaging fight in the game. And probably the second hardest boss for me across this entire DLC series. In third place, we've got Sister Frida. She's the ultimate endurance fight of the series. She has a very unique moveset in three very interesting phases, only brought down by some mild annoyances. In second place, and the hardest boss on this list, is the Orphan Akas. I genuinely think Phase 2 Orphan is the hardest boss in the Soul series outside of Elden Ring. It's fast, vicious, and really satisfying to complete. My only problem is the insta-kill meatball wall attack. Fuck that move. And my pick for the best boss in FromSoft DLC history is Slave Knight Gale. Although he's nowhere near the hardest, he's definitely the most fun boss to fight. Only one really annoying move, but it's nowhere near as annoying as the meatball barrage. It's got the setup, it's got the lore, it's got the presentation, it's got the gameplay, and most of all, it's super fun. And it's my pick for the best boss in the entire DLC catalog. And with that, that's everything. If you're hearing this, thank you so very much for watching until the very end. But if you played these, how would you rank these DLCs and these bosses? I feel like people can like these bosses for multiple different reasons. So I'm very interested to see what you guys think. And feel free to let me know if I missed anything or got any lore details wrong, because I know I definitely did. So go ahead and humble me in the comments if you, feel, <laughs> if you feel inclined. But besides that, that's all I got for you today. And I hope you enjoyed this video, because I enjoyed you watching it. Goodbye.